Um, okay, so last week we were talking about the insanity defense, and we're going to keep on talking about that, and then we're going to get into preventive detention. But just to remind you about the schedule for this lecture series, and next week we're going to talk about surveillance, um, all the technology the government's using to spy on us, and how that's regulated, if at all. And then the following week we'll be talking about interrogation. Remember, that's the week we'll be starting early. Um, and Norman and I have talked about it. We're going to start at 8.15 on October 31st, and we're going to end at 9.15. So it's only going to be an hour-long lecture that week. Okay, and then the final week um, will be on juvenile issues, juvenile justice issues, and that will be at the regular time for the regular amount of time. I'm hoping that particular talk will just be about 45 minutes long, and then there will be some time left over where you can ask me anything you want to know about the criminal justice system or the meaning of life or anything else. Um, <laughs> Because I know there's some questions that you all have asked during the breaks or after the lectures which aren't directly on point with what I'm talking about, but nonetheless are interesting issues. So it might be, ni it might be nice and fun to talk about that kind of stuff. But today we're going to talk about the insane defense. Remember, last week um, I started by talking about some famous cases, the Danny McNaughton case back in the 19th century. Uh, Dan Danny McNaughton lent his name to the most famous insanity test we'll be talking about a little bit later. You all remember John Hinckley, the person who tried to assassinate President Reagan, Andrea Yates, the woman who drowned her five children, and then various individuals who might have been found insane but weren't, either because the jury didn't agree with the insanity plea or because the defendants, that is Manson and Kaczynski, decided they didn't want to raise an insane defense. Um, what's been the state's response to the controversy over the insane defense? Well, five states have abolished it. A number of other states have narrowed it in various ways. Uh, in fact, it's not raised very often, despite all the hullabaloo about the insane defense, it's not raised very often. And when it is raised and gets to trial, it rarely wins. And when it does win, the person does not walk free, but almost always spends a long time in a mental hospital. Those are all important facts to keep in mind when thinking about the insane defense, whether we should have it, uh, what the ins if we do have it, what the insanity test should look like. Um, before we talk about specific insanity formulations, specifically tests for insanity, I think it's useful to go back and think about why we have the insane defense. There are many people, among them some of my relatives, who think we should get rid of the insane defense. It makes no sense to have the insane defense, they say. If a person does the crime, you ought to do the time. It doesn't make sense, even if, if a person's mentally ill, to excuse them for their crime, to say they're not guilty for the crime. Um, so what are the reasons, or what are, what are the possible reasons for having an insane defense? Uh, a defense that actually excuses a person for committing a criminal act, including very serious criminal acts. Well, there are two principal reasons for the insane defense. Remember the purposes of punishment we talked about in the very first lecture, retribution, deterrence, the individual prevention goals. I'm going to talk about those same purposes of punishment again, this time in the context of the insane defense trying to figure out why we might have the insane defense. And the first purpose of punishment, remember, is retribution. What's retribution about? We have punishment because people who commit crimes deserve to be punished. They're blameworthy. They're culpable. Because they've done something bad, they deserve to be punished. But the argument with respect to the insane defense is, even though they've done something bad, they don't deserve to be punished. Why? Because of their mental state. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know it was wrong, or they couldn't help themselves. Those are the kinds of arguments you see with insanity cases. And retributivist people who believe in retribution as a purpose of punishment often agree with that argument. They say it's true. People with serious mental illness are not blameworthy. Uh, it can be a difficult issue, though. The classic example that law professors often use to illustrate a person who is insane is the so-called lemon squeezer. What is that case? It's actually, I don't think it ever happened. It's a law professor's hypothetical dream, but nonetheless it does illustrate uh, how the insane defense could work in, in, in a case. This is an individual who was squeezing his wife's neck, ended up killing her, but as he was squeezing his wife's neck, he thought he was squeezing a lemon for his iced tea. Okay, now that's a person who's pretty much out of touch with reality. <laughs> if you think you're squeezing a lemon when in fact you're squeezing your wife's neck, you are, I think by most people's account, insane and not blameworthy. That's the important point. You can't be held blameworthy for that kind of incident if you think you're actually squeezing a piece of fruit as opposed to a person's neck. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that kind of event rarely occurs. Rarely is someone as impaired as in the lemon squeezer example. More realistic case, the Andrew Yates case. 
Okay? Now, Andrew Yates clearly had paranoid schizophrenia. There's no doubt about it. And I explained to you last week what schizophrenia is. Um, she had very incoherent thoughts. She had uh, delusional thoughts. She had hallucinations. There's no doubt about that. So does that make her blameless? Does that excuse her act of killing her five children? Well, you have to dig deeper than that. It's not just enough to find whether the to decide whether the person is mentally ill or not. You have to figure out what is the impact of the mental illness on the person's beliefs and desires and conduct at the time of the offense. Well, the prosecution in the Andrew Yates case pointed out that right after she, she drowned her children, she called 911. What does that suggest? She knew what she did was wrong. And also remember, I said this last week, she waited to drown her children until after her husband and her mother had left the house. Well, that also suggests that um, she wasn't totally impaired. She wasn't like the lemon squeezer. Okay? At the same time, if you believe the defense psychiatrist, she also believed that if she didn't kill her children, they would go to hell. Or if she did kill them, they would go to heaven. Well, that's pushing her back towards the blameless side, right? Because if she actually believed that, if she actually believed if she didn't kill her kids, they go to hell, and if she did, they go to heaven, that's sounding like the kind of situation where maybe you could say, well, if you believe that actually is true, and of course that's a big if, but if, if you believe she actually believed that, then you could see how she could think her actions were not wrong and how a jury might say that's not blameworthy, that's actually blameless, if that was the reason for the killing. But it's a tough issue, which is why she was convicted the first time and only found not guilty for reason of insanity the second time. So, it's a difficult issue, but it is, these two cases do illustrate that retribution and the, the retribution as a purpose of punishment can help explain why we have the insane defense. There are some people that are so mentally impaired they don't deserve to be punished. Okay? Now whether you think Andrew Yates fits in that category is a tough question, but there are some people, like the lemon squeezer, who clearly don't deserve punishment. One other principal purpose of punishment is deterrence. Right? We want to deter people from committing other crimes. And the theory behind the insane defense here is there are certain people, because of their mental illness, are just not deterrable. Okay? They don't listen to the dictates of the criminal law. They aren't able to process it, at least in the specific situation they're in. Um, well, you might say, well, all criminals are undeterrable. Otherwise, they wouldn't commit the crime, right? Uh, if they were deterrable, they wouldn't commit the crime. And I want to make a distinction here between non-mentally impaired criminals and mentally impaired people who commit crimes. So, it's true that a lot of criminals are not deterred at the time of their crime. Almost QED, right? <laughs> that almost follows. They're not deterred at the time of the crime because they commit it. And it, it is true that a lot of individuals are not deterrable because they don't think they're going to get caught. Or they're not too worried about punishment. Let me illustrate that point by referencing a research study which was entitled, it's a great study, it's one of the best titles to a research article that I've seen. Picking Pockets at a Pickpockets Execution. Picking Pockets at a Pickpockets Execution. You get the point already, right? <laughs> Okay, back in merry old England, they used to execute pickpockets, right? To deter pickpockets from picking pockets. Yet what happened? Picket pockets were picking pockets. Huh? That's a Peter Piper. Anyway, you, know, you get the point. And that is not the kind of undeterrability we're talking about with respect to the insane defense. Okay, we're talking about a person who doesn't care about the criminal law. Okay, it's not that they're they don't think they're, gonna, they're not going to get caught, and so they go ahead and commit the crime. They're just not thinking about the criminal. Andrea Yates, arguably, didn't care whether she got caught or not. She called 911 right after she did it. She didn't care about being caught. She was worried about other things. The criminal law wasn't speaking to her at the time she drowned her children. At least that was the defense argument. Okay? Think of John Hinckley, the person who tried to assassinate President Reagan. Was he thinking about the criminal law at the time he tried to kill Reagan? No. He was trying to get Jodie Foster to fall in love with him. At least that's the defense argument. Remember that from last week? And in further, further bolstering that argument, he committed his offense, trying to assassinate the President of the United States, in front of roughly 200 police officers, suggesting he's not very deterrable in the real sense. He's totally undeterrable. At least that was the argument by the defense. That's a different kind of undeterrability than you have with the average criminal. At least that's the argument. And that's another reason why we have the insane defenses. There are certain people that just really are not deterrable, regardless of what the criminal law says. Again, they're hard cases. You could argue in both the Yates and Hinckley case they were deterrable. I'm not saying it's a slam dunk argument in either of those cases. I'm just saying on a spectrum, 
they're further along toward undeterability than the pickpockets are. Okay? Now, there are other reasons given for the insanity defense that I don't think are as good. But you hear them given. Remember the individual prevention purposes of punishment? Those are the purposes of punishment. We punish people to prevent these particular individuals from doing it again. How do we implement that, those purposes? Incapacitation. We put them in prison so they can't commit a crime again. We treat them so they can't commit a crime again. And some people argue that the insane defense is designed to implement the rehabilitation goal of individual prevention. We need the insane defense to make sure these mentally ill people, these people with mental illness, get treatment. Well, that may be true, but it's a pretty inefficient way of making sure people with mental illness get treatment. Because most estimates today are that at least 15% of our prison population is suffering from serious mental illness. And there's no way we're going to find 15% of our prison population insane. It's just not politically feasible. And in fact, this is just people with serious mental illness, psychosis. If you broaden the definition of mental disorder to include everything that's in the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostical Manual, it would be way above 15%. The insane defense is not an efficient way of making sure people with mental illness get treatment. We need to have a different approach providing treatment to people in prisons and jails. Okay? The insane defense is not the way to accomplish that goal. Um, Another way of achieving the individual prevention goal is, as I said earlier, to incapacitate people, to uh, prevent them from doing it again. And one argument for the insane offense is these people are particularly dangerous, right? They're, they're, they've hurt someone and they're mentally ill to boot, so they're abnormally dangerous. And that's why we need the insane offense to make sure that we can incapacitate them in a mental hospital um, so they won't do it again. The problem with that argument for the insane offense is and this is something I alluded to last week. The research shows over and over again that even people with serious mental illness are no more dangerous as a category than the general population. They're no more likely to commit violent crime than people in the general population. Now, there's some subcategories of people with serious mental illness who might actually be more likely to commit violent crimes. But people with serious mental illness as a broad category, people with psychosis, people with schizophrenia, are no more likely to commit violent crime than the general population. I say that over and over again because I don't think most of you believe it. But in fact, that's what the research shows. Now, if instead, as I mentioned this last week, but I'll repeat it, if a person with mental illness is also abusing substances, that raises the potential danger. But mental illness by itself is not a particularly significant risk factor for crime. Okay? And that's another reason, this this is, that's the reason this particular argument for the insane defense doesn't make a lot of sense. I think the first two reasons make a lot of sense, the, the last two don't. There's a last reason I'll mention. Some people say we need the insane defense as a safety valve. There are some cases where the person clearly did do it and wasn't quote unquote crazy, wasn't mentally impaired at the time of the offense. But nonetheless, we feel a lot of sympathy for the individual, and so there should be a defense for that person. We could call it just a sympathy defense, but we, that doesn't sound very good. We don't want a statute that says there shall be a sympathy defense. So we instead use the insane defense for that particular purpose. Uh, the example I want to use here is the Lorena Baba case. Anybody remember her? <laughs> Everybody remembers her, right? Uh, especially the men that are crossing their legs right now. Um, she's, she's the woman who removed a part of her husband's anatomy and then threw it uh, in a ditch on the side of the road. Luckily, they recovered that part of his anatomy, and he's restitched. But in any event, she was uh, charged with the attempted assault. It could have been attempted murder. I mean, assault. It could have been attempted murder. She pleaded insanity, and she won. Now, she was not mentally impaired. She did not, at least in the traditional sense, she did not have a serious mental illness. And she certainly intended to do what she did. There was no doubt about that. But the jury acquitted her anyway. They used the insane offense to register their dismay over Lorena's husband's behavior. Because he wasn't a very nice person. If you remember that case, he beat her quite often. He was a very nasty individual. You can sort of understand why she did what she did. Maybe not quite the way she did it, but nonetheless, you can understand why she was pretty irritated with her husband. And the jury expressed its sympathy with that situation by finding her insane. But I don't think that's a good result. I don't think we should use the insane defense for that kind of case. Nonetheless, it is a reason sometimes advanced for the insane defense. So I just thought I'd offer it to you. Um, so, yeah, question? Yeah, I want to, I went for a little direction. I want to go back to deterrence. Yes. Okay. So if we're saying the insane are not deter, 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 deterrable. Deterrable. 
Okay, that's a very good question. The question is, um, if deterability is one of the rationales for the insane defense, does that mean that, I'm going to call them psychopaths, but you, you hear different words, you psycho, psychopathy, sociopathy, sometimes antisocial personality disorder, but that's a much broader category than psychopathy. Basically, psychopaths are what many lay people think is evil incarnate. Okay, it's the kind of person, you know, Silence of the Lambs, the people you see on TV shows and movies all the time, even though Hollywood would have you believe that 50% of our population is composed of psychopaths. It's not true, but there are psychopaths out there. And one way to describe a psychopath is someone who has a Swiss cheese superego. Okay, superego is basically what Freud would call your, what is Freud's term for your conscience. Swiss cheese superego means you have lots of holes in your conscience. You don't understand why people think various things are wrong if you're a psychopath. Okay, you know the law makes murder a crime, but you don't understand why. Why is murder a crime? Murder can be very helpful to me, the psychopath, on occasion. If I want somebody's property, the best way to get it is to kill him. What's the big hullabaloo about? That's, believe it or not, the way a psychopath thinks. Um, I once had a client, uh, an 18-year-old client, who was diagnosed with psychopathy, um, and he was housed in a detention center, and he was a big problem, a big behavioral problem in the detention center. Why? because um, he would routinely confront younger people in this detention center, take their hands, and break their fingers. And when asked why, he said, well, I like the sound of it. I like the sound of fingers breaking. He had no empathy whatsoever. He had no understanding of why that's harmful. Okay? Now, is this person deterrable? Not on the deterrable spectrum, maybe deterrable if you're holding a gun to his head and says, don't break those fingers. But on the other hand, toward the undeterrable end of the spectrum. Does that mean we should find that person insane? I'm not going to answer that question yet. I think it's a good question, but I want to hold off on it, because we're going to get back to that. Okay? Yes? If the lady had killed her husband instead of... Right. She would have gotten... Okay. Good, good point. This is a point I was going to make later, but I think it's important to make now, and I don't mind making it now. The insane defense does not just depend on what psychiatrists and psychologists say about mental state. It depends on a whole bunch of issues, including the charge. And I think you're probably right. If Louina Bobbitt's surgery had ended up killing her husband, the jury might have come out differently. It's easier to be sympathetic when the victim's still alive than when the victim's dead. The insane defense does sometimes succeed in homicide cases, but not very often. Okay? Partly because of what you just said. The insane defense is based on a whole host of factors, not just the degree of mental impairment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about Thomas Sass' argument that you should find him guilty but to justify Right. Um, the question is about a man named Thomas Zaz. Some, oh, a lot of you have heard of him. Okay, great. Um, very good audience. Very well-read audience. The, Thomas Zaz is famous for saying, essentially, there's no such thing as mental illness. There are problems in living, but there's no such thing as mental illness. Mental illness is an invention of psychiatrists and psychologists who want to get reimbursed by insurance companies. That's basically what his argument is. I don't buy it, but, but back in the 60s and 70s, when everyone had long hair and was very radical, it was a very popular argument, okay? Um, that mental illness is just a trumped-up story um, that psychiatrists use for explaining different behavior. Um, so, yes, Tom Mazzaz would have said we should get rid of the insane defense. Find the people guilty, but they can give them treatment. Now, I don't happen to agree with his premise that there's no such thing as mental illness, but his solution isn't necessarily a bad one. Uh, we could do that. And in fact, Oregon, the state of Oregon, doesn't have the verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. It has the verdict of guilty, but insane. So you find the person guilty. Then you send them to whatever facility treats them. It might be a prison, because maybe prisons have good mental health treatment. But more likely, it's going to be a mental hospital. So maybe that's a sort of a hybrid solution uh, based on... I'm going to take one more question, and then I'd better move on, okay? Yeah, Roberta? Uh, if um, an MRI shows the brain is physically damaged, mm -hmm. so this person has... Right. Do they ever use that? Yeah, that? the question is, is neurological evidence ever used as a basis for the insane defense? Absolutely yes, and I'm going to get to that, okay? Okay, so what are some of the modern insanity tests that try to implement these purposes of... Uh, of, of excusing the blameless and excusing the undeterrable. Well, virtually every insane defense requires, first of all, serious mental illness. 
Now, why do I uh, emphasize the word serious? Because there are over 300 diagnoses in the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostical Manual, including, for instance, caffeinism. Anybody got caffeinism? <laughs> okay. That's a diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Presumably, you don't want to, I mean, some defense attorneys might want to get an insane defense based on caffeinism, but probably the legal system isn't going to recognize that. So it has to be a serious mental illness, a psychosis, schizophrenia, maybe a bipolar disorder, possibly dementia, one of those really serious kinds of disorders that significantly impair a person's reasoning process. Why? Because, first of all, it's a practical matter, otherwise too many people would be excused. Uh, but also, there are some people who don't understand that a particular act is wrong, but it has nothing to do with irrationality. For instance, take a person from a foreign country. There are cases where people from a foreign country have been charged, for instance, with sodomy. These are old cases, but nonetheless they've been charged with sodomy because it was okay to do that in their country. But does that mean it's okay to do in this country? No. Is there misunderstanding of the law a result of mental illness? No. So they would not be excused for their crime. Okay? Ignorance of the law is no excuse unless you're mentally ill. Mental illness makes you irrational if you have a serious mental illness. Schizophrenia, bipolar, disorder, dementia. And that mental disorder has to cause a particular kind of dysfunction. And I have the word cause underlined because you can have, and this is what prosecutors often argue, you can have a serious mental illness, schizophrenia, but that may not be the cause of the crime. One of the clients I represented years ago just charged with shoplifting. Okay, not a major crime. Um, and we weren't going to raise the insane defense in the case, but it nonetheless illustrates an interesting point. She was charged with theft, with shoplifting, because she stole food from a grocery store. And the defense attorney who I got the case from said, we ought to assert insane defense. She's got a very long history of psychiatric hospitalizations. There's no doubt about the fact she suffered from schizophrenia. And that was clear. She was clearly suffering from schizophrenia. So we interviewed her. She says, why did you take that food from the store? I was hungry. Oh. That's the reason, yeah, I was hungry. I needed food, I didn't have any money. There was food in that store, I went and got it. Now, arguably, the reason she stole that food had nothing to do with mental illness. It's what any poor person might do if they have no money and they need food. Now, you can argue over that, but at least the prosecution has an argument that the mental illness did not cause that crime. It was something else. It's just something to keep in mind. The mental illness has to be linked to the crime. Assuming you got those two things, then you have different kinds of dysfunction that can lead to ins insanity defense. You need serious mental illness that causes, one formulation is a lack of intent. In other words, an inability to intend the crime. Lawyers like to call this the mens re issue. Those of you who know Latin, mental thing, right? The mental thing, mens re. We lawyers like to use Latin occasionally to keep the scum out, right? We, to, look, to look like we know something, so we use Latin phrases in cocktail parties, but in fact, this just means intent. It doesn't mean anything real, um, specialized. And by the way, a lot of professionals do this too, right? So it's not just us that, that does this. So the idea is that mental impairment can lead to a lack of intent. And you often hear defense attorneys and prosecutors say, this is what the insane defense is about. It's wrong. This is not what the insane defense is about. Virtually every mentally ill person who's found insane does have the intent commit the crime. Think about John Hinckley. Did he intend to kill President Reagan? You bet your sweet bippy he did. Did Andrea Yates intend to drown her children? Yes. Did Danny McNaughton intend to kill Prime Minister Peel? Remember that case I told you about last week? Yes. Anyone, almost anyone other than the lemon squeezer, does have mens rea for the crime. So this is a very narrow version of the insane defense. It's the version that those five states that have abolished the insane defense have those five states that got rid of the insane defense, they have a lack of mens rea defense. It excuses very few people, at least if applied literally, because almost every mentally ill person is able to form intent. The, the next type of insane defense, um, I'm going to skip the, the case of Eric Clark because I want to move on. The next kind of formulation you see, and this is a very popular one, it's probably the most popular one, is a person's insane if, is, if as a result of serious mental illness, um, the person did not know or appreciate that the act was wrong. This is the, basically the McNaughton test that I mentioned last week. It's the test that Tennessee has. It's the test that most states have. Uh, you can get into very interesting issues here. First of all, some states use the word know. Some states use the word appreciate. What's the difference? Well, no connotes a more shallow form 
of cognitive impairment. Most mentally ill people know it's wrong to kill. Most mentally ill people, people with mental illness, know it's wrong to try to hurt someone. But do they appreciate the wrongfulness of harming someone or killing someone? Okay? Um, take the John Hinckley case. Does he know it's illegal to shoot the President of the United States? Yeah, he knew that. Did he appreciate, did he internalize emotionally the enormity of what he was doing? He was killing the President of the United States so an actress would fall in love with him. At least if he believed the defense argument. So did he appreciate the wrongfulness, the incredible wrongfulness of what he was doing? That was the defense argument, and maybe you don't buy it, but the jury did, right? Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And they focused on this word appreciate because they were in the District of Columbia which had the word appreciate in its test. And the defense focused on that lack of appreciation language. Um, let me talk about the airplane assassin case. I've already talked about McNaughton some. The airplane assassin case is one of my cases. It's an individual I represented. He lived by himself. He'd been drinking for years. Um, as a result, he had a form of dementia, some kind of organic deficit as a result of his long-term substance abuse. Uh, he became very paranoid over the years. Uh, and in fact, he came to believe that crop dusters that were flying over the fields near his house were actually government airplanes bombarding his house with electronic particles. <coughs> and he had proof. There are cracks in the foundation of his house. Okay? Those came from the airplane. He got mad. He went to the authorities. He said, you've got to stop this. Of course, the authorities, just like in the Dan and McNaughton case, remember that case last week? They sort of laughed at him and said, right, go home. One day, though, he'd had it because he found his dog dead. Okay? That was the last straw. He got his gun, he went outside, and shot at the crop duster. Now, this is an incredible part of the story. He actually hit the crop duster. <laughs> do you know how hard that is? I don't care how low the plane is flying to the ground. That's very hard to do. He put a hole in the fuselage. Not, luckily, no one was hurt. No one was hurt, but there was a hole in the fuselage. Okay? We raised an insane defense. Now, interestingly enough, when, when the question is whether he knew right from wrong, whether he knew it was illegal, there is no crime of shooting an airplane in the state of Virginia. Um, so that, that was an interesting little twist. They just hadn't gotten around to making that a crime yet in the state of Virginia. On the other hand, it was assault. There's no doubt about that. And the prosecutor could charge um, this individual with assault. Um, and, he, and when we asked him, is it, is it illegal to shoot at airplanes? Yeah, he said. Clearly it is. But I was justified in doing that. They were ruining my property, killing my animals, I had a, and they wouldn't do anything about it. I had a right to go out there and shoot that crop duster. Now, is he blameless? Is he undeterrable? Should we excuse him? He knew it was right from wrong, but did he appreciate, given his belief system, that it was wrong to do it? Very interesting question. Without belaboring the point, the defense can argue he thought it was right, he thought he was justified. When someone's destroying your property and killing your dog, you have a right to use force to repel, but the prosecution can argue you don't have the right to use deadly force to prevent property destruction or prevent harm to animals. Maybe you can use other kinds of force, but you can't go kill the person if all that person is doing is hurting your property and killing your animals. Now, some of you with dogs might feel very differently. I can kill anybody who hurts my dog, but nonetheless, that's the level at which these arguments sometimes get to. You actually take the belief system to be true and then figure out whether it's justified given those beliefs. Is it justifiable to try to shoot down an airplane that you think is hurting your property, hurting your animals? Um, now let's get to psychopaths. This is the question that was asked earlier. If the test is inability to appreciate wrongfulness, does a psychopath appreciate the wrongfulness of his or her actions, and it's usually him, but you can't have female psychopaths. Does a psychopath appreciate the wrongfulness of their actions? If I'm a defense attorney, are you? No way. Think of the example I used earlier. A psychopath knows it's wrong, knows that society thinks it's wrong, but doesn't understand why, doesn't emotionally appreciate it. In fact, one definition of psychopath is no emotion, no affect, which is what the psychiatric term is for emotion. No ability to internalize what the harm means to the victim. And in fact, there are legal cases where courts have accepted an insane defense in a case involving psychopathy, going back to your question, okay? Either because they are blameless, they don't really appreciate wrongfulness, or because they're undeterrable. Unless you're holding a gun to their head, they're gonna do it anyway, because they, they don't see why they shouldn't, even though they know the law makes it illegal. On the other hand, it's fair to say that 99% of the time, those kinds of arguments lose. There are some cases where this argument wins, but if it's a psychopath, usually 
there's no way that person's going to get an insane defense. Simply because we, jury, see that that kind of person is evil incarnate, like I said before. Okay, they don't have a conscience, they should go away for a long time and not be excused by reason of insanity. But I'm just trying to point out there's a lot of play in this language, and it is an interesting philosophical debate over whether a psychopath should be excused or not. I will bet that the philosophers on this campus who have thought about this at all, and, and I know philosophers on other campuses, if you took a poll, most of them would say psychopaths should not be convicted. Psychopaths should be excused because they lack a basic equipment that it takes to be human. They lack that ability to empathize. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that. Those are philosophers. I'm not a philosopher, I'm a lawyer. Okay? Lawyers have different agendas. But philosophers, when they get into this, will often argue that psychopaths should be excused for the reasons I just went through. Okay, there's another kind of insanity test which is focused more on undeterrability, more directly. It's called the irresistible impulse defense. Does the person have an irresistible impulse? Okay, sometimes called the policeman at the oboe test, which I sort of like, because it gets across the idea you have to be really undeterrable in order to do it. In other words, what the policeman at the oboe test implies is that you're only insane if you would have done it had a cop been standing right next to you when you did it. Policeman at the elbow. Okay, that means you have to, the impulse has to be pretty irresistible in order to be found not guilty by reason of insanity under this test. Does anyone ever meet it? Well, think about Hinckley. He had 200 cops standing at his elbow, and he did it. So, maybe that's the reason he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. There are some people with psychosis who have what are called command hallucinations. In other words, God or something else tells them to do it. And it's called a command hallucination because apparently it's a pretty powerful command. On the other hand, and this is the difficulty here, not everyone who has a command hallucination actually acts it out. A lot of people with serious mental illness are able to resist, for whatever reason, command hallucinations. So, is the impulse irresistible or merely not resisted? It's a very difficult issue to figure out. And how about people with pedophilia? Talk about urges. If you talk to some of these people, they have incredibly strong urges. Some of them even commit child molestation knowing a cop is very close by. Maybe not standing right next to them, but on the other side of the wall. The urge is so strong. Are we going to excuse those people by reason of insanity based on some kind of irresistible impulse defense? Usually not, in case you're sitting on the edge of your seat with bated breath. Usually not, but I'm pointing out there's at least an argument that could be made. Where if I were the prosecutor, I would argue in the case of people with pedophilia, I'd go back to the very top of the slide and say this person does not have a serious mental illness. It's not a psychosis. It's not irrational. I mean, it is a, it's crazy and bizarre maybe, but it's not irrational in the psychotic sense for a person with pedophilia to do what they do. So they shouldn't even get past stage one, the serious <coughs> mental illness requirement. But there is a live issue there. And defense attorneys have argued irresistible impulse in connection with pedophilia. The broadest insanity test is the so-called product test. Why is it so broad? Because it excuses anyone whose crime is the product of mental illness. Anyone whose crime is a product of mental illness. You can see why that's a very broad test. It really doesn't limit, in terms of functional impairment, the effect of mental illness. It just says, hey, if the crime was a result of mental illness, you're excused. Does any state have this test? New Hampshire, the huge state of New Hampshire, has this test. But New Hampshire never acquits anybody but by reason of insanity anyway, so it probably doesn't have a big impact. At one time, though, a couple of jurisdictions had this test, and they got rid of it. Why? Too many people were being excused by reason of insanity, including psychopaths. Okay. Yes, question? Is a, is a crime of passion uh, a momentary? Good question. Um, the question is, is a crime of passion something that could form the basis for an insane defense? First of all, I will say, and this will be the answer to every question like this, defense attorneys certainly have argued that. Of course, they'll argue anything. Just like you can be sued for anything, defense attorneys can argue anything in terms of uh, insanity. But it usually loses. It's sometimes formulated as temporary insanity. Okay, heat of passion. Uh, a classic example, a husband finds his wife in bed with someone else and goes totally crazy. Um, usually loses why? There's no history of serious mental illness. And going back to that very first question on the last slide. And that's what prevents a lot of these kinds of cases from getting... Uh, an insanity, a successful insanity claim recognized by the jury, uh, getting an insanity claim recognized by the jury. Um, but it has been tried in 
probably today, if I were a defense attorney, I wouldn't argue heat of passion, temporary insanity. I'd say my client has a diagnosis of intermittent explosive personality disorder. <laughs> Ever heard of that one? <laughs> that means you have really serious temper tantrums, okay? I mean, it means a little bit more than that, but that's, I dress it up as a diagnosis and try to fit it into the category of serious mental illness. I'd probably lose, but hey, it's worth a try if there are 10 eyewitnesses to my client's killing. The only thing I've got to go on is insanity. Okay. Yeah, the question is, what about mental retardation? I think probably most of you know the difference between mental illness and mental retardation, but just in case you don't, mental illness, I've described already, uh, serious mental illness usually has some form of psychosis or bipolar illness associated with it. Um, mental retardation instead is based on a congenital problem, usually having to do, usually evidencing itself in a relatively low IQ. Uh, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual essentially defines mental retardation as someone with an IQ of 7 or below and adaptive de deficits, that is inability to function uh, uh, and, and carry out basic skills on an everyday basis. Um, you can have an insane defense based on mental retardation. It is possible. Your IQ has to be pretty low and you have to be pretty dysfunctional as a realistic matter, but it is per possible to have an insane defense based on mental retardation. If it causes those dysfunctions, an inability to know right from wrong or some kind of a impulse, impulsive impairment. Okay, so what I want to do, this is the last slide on the insane defense before we get to prevent detention. I want to talk about some of the interesting issues, that come, and we've already started exploring them. Some of your questions have started exploring these issues. But I think it's interesting to see uh, what uh, attorneys have been arguing and what juries have been accepting. One kind of argument we saw a lot after the Vietnam War and are starting to see again as a result of the Iraqi and Afghanistan conflicts, is the argument that due to combat stress, soldiers develop something called post-traumatic stress syndrome. Most of you have probably heard of that, right? Post-traumatic stress syndrome. And this results in major impairments. So for instance, one case out of Louisiana involved a person who had fought in Vietnam. Very, very dangerous duty he had in Vietnam. He was a scout for patrol, constantly having to dodge bullets, constantly killing people. He comes back to this country, and at one point in his life, he apparently has a flashback to Nam. While he's asleep, or he's asleep, but then he wakes, he has a flashback, he gets up on his roof with his automatic rifle, which you could still have in those days legally, and started firing, okay, thinking he was in Nam. On the day of the offense, his wife and he got in an argument. His wife went to another home. He claims he had another post-traumatic stress disorder flashback, he went to the other home where his wife was and just started shooting wildly. His argument was he believed he was back in Nam cleaning out a hooch of enemy soldiers and civilians. And that was okay to do during the Vietnam War. So basically it's like the Andrew Yates case. If you believe, his, if you, if you assume his beliefs are true, now that's a big if, you might not believe his story, but if you believe his story, you could argue he was blameless. He thought he was back in Nam killing enemy soldiers. He wasn't killing, in fact, his wife and her brother and so on, all the people he killed. He actually killed three people, unfortunately. Um, and after, by the way, after he, he stopped shooting, he just um, went back to his car and sat there. The argument was he had post-traumatic stress syndrome that made him insane, blameless, perhaps undeterrable. Um, I think probably the better argument in these cases, if you believe his story, is what's called the automatism defense. And I just want to introduce this briefly to show you there are other defenses in this area. It's not just insanity. What's the automatism defense? The classic example of automatism, well, the automatism defense is when there's actually no link between the mind and the body. With all the people I've been talking about up until now, up until now there is a link between mind and body. It may be, uh, the link may be quote unquote crazy, but there is a link. If the mentally ill person wants their finger to pull a trigger, they can get their finger to pull a trigger. But there are some people who as a result of impairment don't have that link between mind and body. An example, people with epileptic seizures, right? This doesn't happen very often, but say you're a person with seizures, you're walking along a cliff with your best friend, you have a seizure, your arm lashes out, you send your friend hurling over the cliff. That's an involuntary act, there's no command by your mind to send your friend over the cliff. That would be an, called an automatism, or an involuntary act defense. Conceivably, people with this kind of um, condition that I just got through describing, better fit under automatism, if you believe their story. In other words, they're on automatic. 
There's no link between their usual mind, that is their non-stressed out mind, and their behavior. They're in what some psychiatrists call a fugue state or dissociative state. And there might be an argument there. In fact, that argument's been made and won. But the reason I'm giving you this as an example is, who knows whether this should be uh, a verdict of insanity or a verdict of automatism. It's ultimately up to a jury. There are good arguments on both sides. The prosecution can certainly argue, first of all, I don't believe this post-traumatic stress syndrome stuff, to use a, f a word made famous by Biden. I don't believe this stuff, but um, even if that doesn't win, you can say, and, and even if you do believe in PTSD and that Vietnam vets can have it, it didn't cause the kind of impairment that's being described. He had some idea of what he was doing. Another example, battered woman syndrome. I'm sure you've heard of this. Um, it's a syndrome, quote unquote, that was essentially invented by a psychologist named Lenore Walker, who studied women who've been battered, like Nor Lenore Walker and other, other people like that, and came to the conclusion that in many battered women situations, there's a three-stage cycle that women go through. Um, usually the relationship starts out pretty loving. That's the first stage. But then in the second stage, there's more stress. There's arguments back and forth. And then the third stage is the beating. And this happens over and over again, these three stages. After the beating, they go back to a lovey-dovey relationship. But then there's the stress. And then there's the beating again. It happens over and over again. Now, Lenore Walker's formulation has been contested by many people. And I'm not going to go into the various ways in which battered woman syndrome has been uh, formulated. The point is that it has been argued that when a battered woman ends up killing her significant other, the person beating her, you all remember the Farrah Fawcett movie where she lights her husband on fire after he's beaten her for years? Uh, that's based on a real case. Are there real cases like that where women have been beaten, kill their significant other? Are they insane? Are they blameless? Um, are they undeterrable? Do they appreciate the wrongfulness of their actions? Is it an irresistible impulse? Our defense attorneys have argued it and sometimes won. Now, you could argue it's not really a mental disease or defect. It's not a serious mental illness. It is a syndrome, but it's not like psychosis. Are they out of touch with reality when they do this? No, they may be very irritated. They may be scared, but they're not out of touch with reality would be the prosecution argument. Pr maybe a better argument, and this is the way most of these cases are now going, is not in terms of insanity, but rather self-defense or provocation. Now, it's pretty hard to argue self-defense if you kill the person while they're asleep, right? But the arguments we made, yeah, but if I hadn't killed him then, he would have woken up and I couldn't have done anything because I'm smaller than he is and he's meaner than I am and there's no way I could defend myself. So I have to kill him while he's asleep. And that argument's actually won. Instead of talking about whether a reasonable person would feel scared in this situation, it's whether a reasonable battered woman would feel scared in this situation. And when it's formulated that way, when self-defense is formulated that way, more likely to win. So that might be a better way to go. Or provocation doctrine. This is the heat of passion kind of argument. Okay? You find your wife in bed with, a, with another guy and you kill the guy or the wife or both. Not insanity. Not self-defense. But you might be able to make a heat of passion argument. In the heat of passion, I just I blew my top. And I'd never do it again, but I did blow my top at that point. Does that give you a complete excuse? No. It reduces the crime from murder to manslaughter. So you're still convicted but only of a much lesser penalty. And that might be the way to go with these battered woman cases if self-defense doesn't work. Another kind of situation, drug-induced psychosis. Here we've got a person who clearly has the psychotic symptoms, okay? The symptoms we've been talking about, out of touch with reality, um, not really understanding what's going on. But the reason they're psychotic, they have these psychotic symptoms, is because they took drugs. Or maybe, in rare cases, because they abused alcohol over and over again. You can have... Uh, hallucinatory dementia, too, as a result of alcohol abuse. Should these people be excused? Well, of course, defense attorneys say, yes, they're psychotic at the time of the offense. What does the prosecution argue? They cause their psychosis. They're at fault for that psychosis. You should not be able to get an excuse based on something you caused. Right? It's like the intoxication offense. You don't get an excuse based on the fact you're intoxicated at the time of the crime because you caused your intoxication. At least a lot of states don't recognize an intoxication offense for precisely that reason. You caused your impairment at the time of the offense. Okay, maybe that, that works, but then think about this case. A lot of people with psychosis at the time of the offense are psychotic because they were taking antipsychotic medications for a while, but then they went off them. 
Why did they go off them? They didn't like the side effects. Or it got too expensive. Or, and this happens unfortunately, they wanted their medication but they couldn't get it. Why? The outpatient clinic wouldn't give it to them. Or there was some other reason why the outpatient clinic wouldn't prescribe medication. You may remember the Andrew Goldstein case. He's the person who pushed a woman in front of a subway in New York City. And he asserted insane defense. He lost, by the way. He lost his insanity claim. Um, one of the reasons he lost is the prosecution said, this guy knew he needed medication and wasn't on medication. Yes, he was psychotic at the time he pushed that woman in front of the subway, but he knowingly went off his medication, and that produced the psychotic symptoms. So that was one of the reasons he lost his insanity defense. But why did he go off medications? He tried to get his medication and couldn't do it the outpatient clinic system failed him. So, that's an interesting issue that's raised in insanity cases. Are you culpable for what you did in the past when you're not culpable at the time of the offense? Are you culpable for going off medication? There are lots of good reasons why people with mental illness go off medication, including they don't like the side effects, they can't get their medication. So, should that be relevant at all? Another interesting case. Anybody know the case of Phineas Gage? Just out of curiosity. This is a person who was a railway worker, while well, I was at work one day, somehow, a railway spike, about yay long, and this thick around, got driven through his chin and through his frontal cortex. He did not die. That's, that's the first amazing part of this story. Secondly, it totally changed his personality. He went from a law-abiding kind of very impulsive, aggressive kind of individual. So, if he commits a crime, should he have an insane offense? Well, a lot of people say, yeah, right? Uh, he's a totally different person. Okay, it makes some sense. Okay, so what about psychopaths? Now, they don't have a spike through their brain, but they're born, neurological research has shown, and this goes back to Roberta's question, with different kinds of brains. And they can't help that. They're born that way. Just like Phineas Gage couldn't help, there was a spike through his head. So, why shouldn't they have a defense? If we're going to give a defense to Phineas Gage, why shouldn't we give a defense to anyone who has an abnormal brain? Now, the answer to that is, we don't give them a defense unless they meet the functional impairments described by the insane defense. If when Phineas Gage commits an offense, he didn't know right from wrong because of that spike, or he had an irresistible impulse because of that spike, then maybe he'd have an insane defense. But if in fact he could control his actions, he knew it was wrong or could appreciate the wrongfulness of his actions, then he shouldn't have a defense. That would be the way it should be analyzed. Same thing with the psychopath, and we've already talked about psychopaths, but the argument would be, if a defense attorney presents brain evidence, a picture of the brain, an MRI, and by the way, you can be very clever with this MRI stuff, because when you see an MRI picture, when, uh, when you see a brain scan, it comes in colors, but that's not the way a brain scan actually looks. They paint those colors on there. And if you paint the colors the right way, you can make the psychopath's brain actually look like the devil. Okay? <laughs> because there are two spikes like this, you paint those red, and it can be very persuasive to a jury, if you're the prosecutor, at least. Okay, but the point being, with a psychopath, they may have different brains, but does that mean they couldn't appreciate the wrongfulness of their conduct, or at least know the wrongfulness of their conduct? Does that mean they had an irresistible impulse? And if the answer to those questions are no, they still shouldn't have an insane defense. So that's one way of dealing with this. Similar kind of issue comes up with arguments based on genes and biology. You know, is there a violence gene? Is there a gene that makes people do things, that, that, that makes them do crimes and, and, and crimes that are beyond their control. A couple of examples of this. For many years, defense attorneys were raising arguments based on the XYY chromosome syndrome. What is that? Essentially, these people have an extra Y chromosome, an extra male chromosome. And there was research that showed, and it still shows, that there's an abnormal number of people with an extra Y chromosome in our prisons. So the argument is, the extra Y chromosome predisposes people to commit crime. Interesting argument. Or take the Mobley case. This is, based, uh, I, this is a case out of Georgia based on a very famous study done by Caspi Echelon. And what it did is it followed a cohort of people for about 20 years. And it found that those individuals who were subjected to serious child abuse when they were children and had low serotonin levels, serotonin is a chemical in the body, when they're subjected to serious child abuse and have low serotonin, 86% of them commit a violent act by the age of 26. Those two variables alone explain 86% of the variance in violent crime. Now you can see what defense attorneys want to do with that one. 
This is an irresistible impulse. My client was abused as a kid, and study, a study of my client shows low serotonin levels. He did commit a violent act. He had no chance. 86% chance he was committing a violent act. He has no control over a serotonin or, or over the fact he was abused as a kid. Should that argument win? Well, the answer is the same as what I gave before. Did that low serotonin, did that child abuse mean he couldn't appreciate the wrongfulness of his actions? Did it mean there was an irresistible impulse? If the answer to those questions are no, then no excuse. Now, some defense attorneys try to use the irresistible impulse defense in these cases by saying, but it was an irresistible impulse. He couldn't control his abuse or his low serotonin, and he couldn't control, therefore, his crime. That's a hard argument in either direction. It, it, intuitively, it makes some sense, but how do you show that he actually had no control? By the way, 14% of people with low serotonin and who abuse his kids did not commit crimes by age 26. So there's some evidence that it's not something that makes you totally out of control. Okay? So anyway, these are some of the interesting issues that come up with genes and biology. And finally, just because you all heard of Patty Hearst, there's the famous brainwashing defense, right? She was kidnapped by the Sibionese Liberation, Ar Liberation Army back in the 60s, and she claimed she was brainwashed by them into believing that their cause was just and the United States government was corrupt, so she ended up robbing a bank. And she was charged with robbing a bank. And also, by the way, attempted murder. At one point, she, sh she fired shots at um, a federal agent. She mounted a very good defense with Ethel Bailey, among other people. Why? Her father was Richard Croesus. And <laughs> the argument didn't win. She lost the argument, but her sentence was reduced on clemency grounds. Because the brainwashing argument did apparently resonate with the governor, um, and so it did help her out, ultimately, in terms of her ultimate disposition. Should it have won? Interesting question. Okay, assuming she really was brainwashed. Now, you can always say, ah, come on, I don't believe that stuff. But assuming there actually was brainwashing, that she actually had come to believe something entirely different because of the effectiveness of the SLL, SLA um, reprogramming. Did she appreciate the wrongfulness of her conduct? Was it an irresistible impulse? Should that matter? Does she have a serious mental illness? You could answer all those questions, no. Or you could argue, hmm, she's really a different person than she started out being. So why isn't that like Phineas Gage, for instance? The SLA is like that spike through the head. It's just not as dramatic. Yeah. Wasn't she kidnapped to start with? Yes, and you could, you could add that in. You could say, and she was forcibly taken by the SLA. Right? I, I'm sorry I left that part out. I should have added that. She was, she was kidnapped by the SLA, um, and that adds to the sympathy, at least, for her. Um, and then the legal argument would be she's a different person. Well, maybe you buy that, maybe you don't. Um, okay, then what about terrorists? They're indoctrinated too, right? To hate Americans. They're different people than they would have been had they been raised in America, for instance, just as an example. So, in other words, how relevant should it be that your environment causes you to be a different person? It's a very difficult question when push comes to sub. Very difficult. Because the environment has a huge impact on the way people are. But should it ever be an excuse? Maybe in extreme situation, maybe the Patty Hearst situation, maybe in a prisoner of war situation, but maybe in another situation. But how do you draw those lines? It can be very difficult. And I'm not going to draw them for you, by the way. I'm not here to give all the answers. I'm just going to raise a lot of questions, which I think are all very interesting ones. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, the question is, um, could you comment on the Twinkie defense? This is a ca uh, the case um, out of San Francisco, uh, where Dan White killed the mayor of San Francisco. Um, he was charged with murder, but he argued, in, he didn't argue insanity, by the way. What he argued was basically he should only be convicted of manslaughter. It was a form of provocation, but a broader form of provocation, reducing the charge from murder to manslaughter. And the basis for that argument was what's been called the Twinkie defense. Okay, that he suffered um, uh, from insulin deficiency, he suffered from diabetes, he ate too many Twinkies, and that caused an imbalance in his biology and led to his failure to really appreciate what he was doing. So it sort of sounds like a mini insanity defense. He wasn't asserting insanity, but it's, it's a form of, it's the same kind of argument. And he ended up being successful, okay? 
He ended up getting the jury to agree to knock it down for murder and manslaughter. Now, should he have won? Again, I said I'm not, I'm not going to provide all the answers, but I think it's a pretty dicey argument. Okay? Um, he clearly intended to kill the mayor. Um, it's hard to argue there's any kind of provocation other than a very generalized one having to do with uh, gay rights and so on. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the case, but you, you may remember it. But it's, it, uh, based on narrow legal doctrine, probably an incorrect verdict. But hey, you get a good defense attorney, good experts, you might be able to convince the jury. And Dan White was able to. Okay, so as usual, I'll give you a reference if you're interested, and here it is. But what I want to do is move on to preventive detention and spend uh, the remaining time on this. And the reason I put this subject here is because in some ways it's, it's easy to segue from what we just got through talking about to preventive detention. Because what happens to people who are found not guilty by reason of insanity? They're preventively detained. Okay? They're put in a mental hospital to prevent them from hurting someone else. That's a form of preventive detention. Preventive detention's got a very uh, nasty name. It, it's developed into a very nasty label. When people hear the phrase preventive detention, they think, ooh, that's a bad thing. We don't want that to occur. But in fact, we've been doing it for centuries to people with mental illness. And one of the questions I want to raise is, why just people with mental illness? Why not other people? Or if it's not okay to do it to other people, why is it okay to do it to people with mental illness? I think it's a very useful question to ask. Why are, until recently, are people with mental illness the only people who can be subjected to long-term preventive detention? We can't do it to other dangerous people. Psychopaths, we can't do it to psychopaths. We can convict them and sentence them, but we can't preventively detain them. Only people with serious mental illness can be preventively detained. Okay? So I, that's what we're going to talk about. What, what has happened in the last 10, 15, 20 years is we have seen an expansion of preventive detention beyond people with serious mental illness to other categories of people, uh, including sexual predators. That's a phrase that's used quite often. What are sexual predator statutes? Uh, about 20 states now have them, but they didn't exist prior to 15, 20 years ago. What they allow is preventive detention of someone who has completed their sentence. So let's say you have a child molester who's given a 15-year sentence, served his time for that, what should ordinarily happen at the end of the 15 years? Let out, right? But under these sexual predator laws, if the prosecutor can show that this person's dangerous and dangerous beyond his or her control, that's the language often used, then the person can be kept in detention for preventive purposes, not as punishment for a past crime, but rather to prevent future crimes. This is a very controversial issue. Not so much with the mentally ill, for some reason, but it's very controversial when we start going beyond people with serious mental illness, even to people like child molesters, much less to other people. And, and this sexual predator stuff, by the way, is expanding now. It's not just sexual predators, but it's any dangerous offender in some jurisdictions that is now being subject to preventive detention. It's controversial. Why? Because we're confining someone not because of what they've done. We're not punishing them for a past act. We're confining them for what they might do. And some people argue that's a violation of the entire premise of the criminal justice system, which is based on free will and autonomy. We shouldn't be able to detain someone unless they've chosen of their own free will to do something. If they haven't chosen to do something yet, we shouldn't be able to confine them. Now, you could argue, well, the child molester did commit a child molestation, but that was 15 years ago, and he's already served his time for that. What we're doing now is preventing to detain him for what he might do in the future, not for that child molestation act 15 years ago. He's already done his time for that. And that's why it's controversial, okay? So I want to talk about preventive detention for that reason, but I also want to talk about preventive detention for an entirely different reason. I want to perhaps cast preventive detention in a slightly more positive light than what I just did. What's the positive light? Preventive detention might actually be the way we can deal with one of the hugest, the, the biggest problems we have in the criminal justice system today, which is mass incarceration. Uh, some of you have already asked questions about this. We have an incredible number of people in prison today. Why do we have so many people in prison? It's partly because we aren't willing to distinguish between the dangerous and the non-dangerous. We just put everybody in prison who's committed an armed robbery. We don't distinguish between dangerous armed robbers and non-dangerous armed robbers. Anyone who commits armed robbery gets 10 years, period as opposed to the, the really dangerous armed robbers getting 10 years, and then also dangerous getting one or two years. Most states don't do that anymore. They used to, but they don't do it anymore. If, in fact, we engage in preventive detention, or to use a slightly less 
uh, pejorative phrase, we engage in selective incapacitation. We try to figure out who are the riskiest people, who are the least riskiest people. We might be able to cut down on our prison population significantly. So let me talk a little bit more about that. First of all, this was the imprisonment rate in the United States back in 1973. 96 people per 100,000. Today, it's 567 per 100,000. This rate has just got, and by the way, this is a conservative estimate. I'm intentionally being conservative here. Some people say over 700 per 100,000. 567 people per 100,000. This is phenomenal increase. Okay? Now, why has this happened? It's partly because we're not engaged in selective incapacitation. We're incapacitating, we're punishing everyone who commits a particular kind of crime based on retributive principles. Remember that purpose of punishment? What's that purpose of punishment? A person should get what they deserve. If you commit an armed robbery, you deserve 10 years. We don't care how dangerous you are. Retributivism has nothing to do with dangerousness. It has only to do with what you deserve. And we know that the moment you commit your offense. If you commit armed robbery, we know you deserve 10 years. Who cares if you're really dangerous or not dangerous at all? Retribution says nothing about dangerousness. Yes? What about the uh, small-time drug dealer? I want to get to that. So the question is about a small-time drug dealer. I want to get to that in just a second. Okay, so this is the uh, in, uh, increase in imprisonment rates. Uh, another, re uh, backing up what I just said, Congress passed something called the Truth in Sentencing Law. Anybody remember this? The Truth in Sentencing Law? Federal funding was contingent, federal funding to the states for their prisons was contingent on them assuring by law that everyone spent at least 85% of their sentence in prison. That's not selective incapacitation. That's making sure everybody spends 85% of, of their prison sentence in prison. That's arguably another reason we have very high prison rates. Yeah, question? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Clovis. How, how, is this not also connected to the fact that there's so much privatization? Yeah, I want to talk about that in a second, OK? okay. I'll talk about that. This, by the way, I, I know this is what's going to happen. Remember last week, everybody got really excited about trying to figure out why the South is more favorable towards the death penalty than any other place. I got more questions and comments about that than any other thing I talked about. <laughs> the question for today is, why is this true? Why is the American imprisonment rate so much higher than the European imprisonment rate? You could cut our imprisonment rate in half, and it would still be four times the European imprisonment rate. What's going on there? And there are all sorts of answers, and I'm not going to get into them right now, because I'm sure each one of you could probably come up with your own answer. We've got more guns, we've got more violence, blah, blah, blah. OK, there are lots of possibilities. But it is a fact. That's the most important thing I want to emphasize right now. And one difference I do want to emphasize is Europe has selective incapacitation, whereas we don't have too much of it. We're starting to develop it. We don't have too much of it. That may be one reason Europeans incarcerate, Europe's incarceration rates are lower. They are winnowing out the least dangerous, releasing them, and only keeping the most dangerous in prison. We don't tend to do that. OK. Well, we're going to get to that. I mean, one is preventive detention, OK? One is engage in selective incapacitation. Even though that's a, a preventive detention is a, a nasty word or a nasty phrase to throw around, that would be one possible solution. There are others, too. Um, so this is just another way of looking at the same information. It is true that the United States has more crime proportionally than many other countries, even though we're certainly not 5% of the world's population, we do have 5% of the world's crime. So we're a more criminalistic country. And again, there are lots of reasons for that, which would be fun to speculate about, but we're not going to right now. The fact remains that even though we have 5% of the world's crime, we have 25% of the world's prison population. Right? So the amount of crime in this country doesn't explain our imprisonment rate. That's the point of this slide. Um, we even beat China. We finally beat China at something. Right? <laughs> China has four times our population and three quarters of a million fewer prisoners. Chew on that for a while. It's always important to mention this. The incarceration rate for African Americans is seven times the incarceration rate of whites. Now, it is true that African Americans do commit more crime, but not at seven times the rate of whites. Okay? So this is disproportionate. Now, going back to your question about drug offenders. Okay, you could say, well, we just have more violence, and we're putting violent people away. Not true. 25% of people in our prisons are there solely because they possess drugs of a certain amount. They're not drug dealers. That would be possessing a whole lot of drugs. 
with the intent to sell. These are people convicted and sent to prison for possessing drugs. 25% of our people in prison are there because of that kind of offense. Now, often it's a short sentence, but sometimes it's a very long sentence. Okay? Sometimes it can be very long. It depends on the state and whether it's a federal crime or a state crime. But you can get very long sentences as well as short sentences. The fact is that at any given moment, 25% of our prisoners are in prison for that kind of offense. Now, we do have a lot of violent offenders in the United States. But our imprisonment policy toward violent offenders has changed drastically. I think I mentioned this briefly a couple of weeks ago. This slide shows you what the average number of years a murderer spends in prison for these periods of time that you see. Back in 1910, the average time a murderer spent in prison was 10 years. You tend to think of 1910 as being a pretty punitive period. After all, we did have the death penalty in almost every state. But hey, the average amount of time a murderer spent in prison was 10 years. Go to 1963, 25 years. So it is going up in the 60s. But then look at 2003. 85 years is the average amount of time a murderer spends in prison. How do you get 85 years? Well, they get life without parole, okay, or life with parole. They end up spending 85 years of their natural life in prison. Or the death penalty, which was calculated to uh, be 80 years in this particular situation. So the average length of time in prison, very long. So one possible solution is we don't implement retributive philosophy. We don't give people what they deserve automatically. We may set the ultimate penalty, the maximum, at what the person deserves. So the maximum penalty a murderer can get is life without parole. The maximum penalty an armed, a robber can get is 10 years. The maximum penalty a rapist can get is 25 years. But we don't make everyone stay in for that entire sentence or for 85% of that sentence. Rather, we evaluate risk. We evaluate their dangerousness and let out earlier those people we don't consider to be serious risks. Yes? I'm confused about the 85 years. Doesn't that mean we've got a lot of guys in prison who are 120 or 100? Yeah, so what it means is they're convicted. They're convicted at age 18, 19, 20, spend a lot of time and die in prison. Or the death penalty, is, as I, I said it very quickly, I should have said it more slowly, the death penalty was equated with 100 years. So that raises the average quite a bit. If you get the death penalty, that's equated with 100 years. Okay, and so that raises the average. But we had the death penalty back in 1910, too. In fact, a lot more death penalty verdicts in 1910 than now, and the death penalty was equated with 100 years for the 1910 data as well. And yet we only got 10 year average in 1910. Okay, yes? Uh, I, I, that's a good question. I don't know for sure. It's the 1980s at some point. This huge rate of imprisonment increase started in the 1970s. What happened in the 1970s? Um, a lot of things. The truth and sentencing movement started, I think the actual law that was passed in the early 80s. I'm not sure about that, though. Um, what else happened? Retributivism became very popular. Why? Because conservatives felt that the old way of doing things, um, indeterminate sentencing, which is what I've been talking about, selective incapacitation, was too lenient. We were letting people out too early. People needed to get what they deserved. And even liberals were jumping on that bandwagon. Why? They thought indeterminate sentencing based on assessments of risk, assessments of dangerousness, was too arbitrary. And in some sense, they were right. African Americans did tend to be found dangerous more often than whites. We got racism. It's going to affect any system we've got. And so the liberals were saying, let's go to a determinate sentencing regime where everyone who commits armed robbery serves the same sentence, so there can't be discriminatory impact. So liberals were in favor of this, too. So that was another reason. Another reason is privatization. Okay? Now, this only came on a little bit more recently. But nonetheless, what we have now in states like Florida is that states are selling their prisons to private entities. But they only will buy the prisons if they have a guarantee of a certain number of prisoners per year. Well, guess what that does to incarceration rates? There's something called the Correctional um, Corporation of America, CCA, which has made an offer to every state in the country that we will buy your prisons and run them for you. And we'll give you a whole bunch of money for this if you guarantee X number of prisoners per year. So I'll leave it to you to figure out what that might do. Okay. So those are some, there are lots of other reasons, by the way. This is like, again, the South and the death penalty kind of question. There are lots of explanations for all this. Um, but I want to get to some of the conceptual stuff. Oh, yeah, question, and then. Is it working? Is, well, working in what sense? Okay, let's talk about it. That's what I want to talk about. Um, in fact, I'm going to skip this and go right to your question. Is it working? There are two it's. 
One eight is determinate sentencing, where you serve 85% of your sentence or more based on retributive, backward-looking kind of punishment. The other, the other option is indeterminate sentencing, selective incapacitation based on risk assessment. Okay? So those are the two options. Which is better? I wish I could tell you for sure. Okay? If your metric is, if your outcome measure is, which is better at reducing crime? It appears, though I have to say this is in quotation marks, that indeterminate sentencing is better. And it makes some sense. Why? Because we're focusing on who's dangerous and who isn't. That's the whole point of indeterminate sentencing. We're trying to figure out who's the most dangerous and who isn't. Whereas determinate sentencing doesn't care about that. Every armed robber is going to stay in 85% of the sentence. Now granted, that may be a long time and you might think, okay, good. Well then they're not going to be able to commit another crime for that sentence that they're serving. But unfortunately, what that also means is, even if you're really dangerous, you're still let out after 85% of your sentence. And, unfortunately, prison happens to have a criminogenic effect on many people. The longer you're in prison, the worse you get in terms of your criminal propensities. And that's been shown over and over again by research. So, again, those would be the reasons why determinate sentencing might not be as good at preventing crime and reducing crime as indeterminate sentencing. But I have to also say the jury's still out on that. Those are some of the reasons why some people argue we should go back to indeterminate sentencing. But I'm not totally convinced of that argument. I think it's, it's a plausible argument for the reasons I just said and for some other reasons as well. But why might it not be a good argument? Well, now I want to get to this. One argument against indeterminate sentencing is that we can't predict who's dangerous and who isn't. It's hard to figure out which armed robbers or rapists or murderers are going to do it again. Now, we do have some instruments that help us with that. But it's a very difficult enterprise because not only do you have to know what the person's like, are they impulsive, are they angry, are they psychopathic, you also have to know what environment they're going to be in because that often determines whether a person commits a crime or not. Are they going to go back to bad friends or good friends? Is their family a mess or not? That kind of thing is also relevant. It's very hard to predict and that's granted. The so-called false positive rate, which is the rate at which we are wrong about whether someone's dangerous, is about 50%. In other words, when we say someone's going to do it, we're wrong about one out of two times. That's scary, right? And what's the false negative rate? When we say someone's not dangerous, we let them out, about 20%. So one out of five times we let someone out thinking they're not dangerous, and in fact, they are. So that's not very good, right? And that would be an argument against indeterminate sentencing. However, what I want to counterpose against that is a determinate sentencing regime. What is a determinate sentence based on? It's based on assessment of culpability, of blameworthiness. What were you like at the time of the crime? How good are we at culpability assessment? We're not very good at risk assessment. How good are we at culpability assessment? Bottom line, we're horrible at it. We're just as bad at culpability assessment as we are at risk assessment. First of all, how do you define what's culpable? I bet you if I asked you what premeditated murder is or what heat of passion is, I'd get 50 different answers in here based on the fact situation. Lawyers like me who teach this stuff spend weeks talking about the definitions of mens re and our students still don't get it. I can tell you because I grade the final exams. <laughs> okay? It's very hard to define what culpability is. And then even if we can define it, how do you figure out whether a particular defendant meets a particular mens re definition? You have to get inside the head. Even defendants don't know exactly what they were thinking a lot of the time. And even if you can do all that, how do you figure out how much a person deserves? How many people think an armed robber should get 10 years? How many five? You're just not answering, you're scared to answer? <laughs> How many one? This is not answerable. I mean, this is all based on intuition, right? This is what retribution is all about, though. You figure out how much the person deserves. Now, one thing you can do is you can start with the death penalty and say the worst people get that and then work your way down. But still, you're going to have five-year differences, 10-year differences between different people as to what they think a person deserves. It's, to use an uh, inartful and uh, professional phrase, it's a crapshoot as to exactly what a person deserves. And the circumstances. Based, excuse me. <laughs> the circumstances can vary from person. Right, different armed robbers are different even if you just focus on the armed robbery. Yeah. They could be a follower. They could be a leader. They could steal $100,000. They could steal $30,000. What? A loaf of bread. There are lots of different variations, and it's very hard to integrate that into a culpability assessment. So I'm not saying we're great at risk assessment. I'm just saying we're not great at culpability assessment either, and that's the alternative, right? Um, last point I want to make, and then we're going to stop. Um, yeah, I'm just going to stop at this point. 
One argument against indeterminate sentencing is we leave this decision about who should be released early up to a parole board. And we can't trust them. Not only are they bad at risk assessment, they're corrupt, they aren't professionals, they don't know what they're doing, and there is some evidence to this effect. In some states, parole boards were just a total mess. Okay? Arbit and this is why liberals didn't like indeterminate sentencing. They said parole boards don't know what they're doing. But answer number one to that is we're better now at risk assessment. We have instruments that are better at risk assessment, that structure the analysis. It's still not perfect, but it is better. And secondly, compare it to the alternative in a retributive regime. Who makes the decisions in a retributive regime? And that is, as to who's charged and what the likely sentence is going to be. The prosecutor. How structured is the prosecutor's decision? Short answer, since we're out of time. Not at all. Okay? <laughs> it's not structured at all. You can get a prosecutor in one jurisdiction charging a person for a crime with the charge will result in a five-year sentence and a prosecutor in another jurisdiction, same facts going for the, the uh, life without parole. That's been shown over and over and over again. There's incredible discretion given prosecutors as to what they charge and what they recommend to the judge for a sentence through the plea bargaining process. So we've got a problem with indeterminate sentencing, but we've also got a problem with determined sentencing in terms of abuses of discretion. And that's sort of the message I want to leave you with. Prevent detention may be the solution. There are problems with it, but there are also problems with the system we got. And if we want to get rid of mass incarceration, indeterminate confinement, selective incapacitation might be uh, something, a very useful solution to think about. Okay, thanks. I'll see you next week.